morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Lim. Um, this is my very first altar conference, why I dress so fancily. Um, yeah, I tend to dress up during first conferences. Um, anyway, just a quick background about me. I was most recently a community manager for a startup based in Europe called Happy Team Check. Um, unfortunately, well, of course, things don't always work out. I am currently, uh, I was laid off recently, but anyway, that's beyond the point. Um, I am also a Wikipedian. I've been a Wikipedian for the last 11 years now. Um, and for the last six years, I've been running Wikipedia Philippines, just a local Wikipedia affiliate in the Philippines and among Filipino communities abroad. Um, that being said, that is the reason why my presentation is called Outside Looking In, Working to Reshape the Cultural Memory of Tech. And basically, this talk in this talk, we'll talk about how a lot of the communities that we build, a lot of the products that we use um, in tech and elsewhere are, as I mentioned in the description, still um, imbibed, if you will, with the cultural experiences of the ones who made, uh, who wants to made those products, built those communities, etc. But the question there is, why is the presentation then called Outside Looking In? The reason for that is because whether you like it or not, whether it, whether you like it or not, whether you see it or not, um, there will always be bias everywhere. Whether that be the fact that the world mourned for Paris, prayed for Paris, but did not for Beirut or for Egypt. Whether that be Wikipedia articles are mostly concentrated in Western Europe and North America. The areas with basically the wider the area, the more geotagged articles there are. And you can see big splotches of black in Africa, Asia, and South America. Whether that be um, tech in general being very white male, um, a lot of your programmers being of a particular demographic. Same with Wikipedians too. A lot of Wikipedians are white male from Western countries and highly educated. And whether that be a lot of the products that we use come from the United States. I'm actually Filipino-American, so I don't want to disparage the United States and the products that it makes. But of course, as someone who lives in the Philippines full-time, sometimes you tend to look at things the other way as well. And so the thing there is that systemic bias in tech is everywhere. And to those who don't belong, they could only look in. So the fact of the matter is, whether we like it or not, as people who come from developing countries, as people who do not necessarily share the same cultural experiences that many of the people in this room share, the only thing that we can do is to look inside and to try as much as possible to emulate the, um, the experiences that, we, that you guys get to experience when using products. That's something that I will talk on later in this presentation. These biases are a result of the specific political, cultural, and socio-economic conditions of our time. So the fact that history is not on our side will also show that the specific configurations of, um, of the world, whether that be tech as a monolith that is not diverse, or the perception that it is not diverse, whether it be that the United States is the richest country in the world, or the, whether we people believe it or not, or whether products are going to mostly embody an America-centric point of view, these are results of things that are external to tech, and these are things that we would have to be cognizant about. Why? Because algorithms, as they say, are not as altruistic as we make them up to be. There have been, people have said that, you know, algorithms, uh, big data, uh, the things that we build are not may perpetually bias. But it's not simply the things that we build and the computer generates outputs that may perpetually bias. It's also the fact that a lot of the products that we build or a lot of the communities that we build end up having people being forced to conform to certain cultural norms which they may not necessarily be most comfortable participating in. So the question there then is that as I mentioned earlier, it's not algorithms. Products themselves are not as altruistic as they seem to be as well. So why? Because our biases unintentionally slip into the products we build and deploy. And the best example of that was the example that I mentioned earlier, the fact that you have safety check by Facebook. Yes, this is actually, the screenshot here is for Typhoon Ruby, which was a typhoon that hit the Philippines um, 
in the middle, r roughly around late last year, it was a very powerful typhoon. But then we have the whole hullabaloo about for human make for man-made disasters, we decided to launch in Paris when there were other um, disasters that were man-made going on in the world as well. And it seemed like uh, Facebook did not care about Beirut or Egypt or what have you, and they only cared about Paris because everyone else was talking about them. This is where we meet the cultural memory of tech. As, um, uh, and basically here we see how this perception, or rather the idea that people, um, people in positions of power in tech are able to shape the specific cultural dialogue that takes place when people use these products. So the question then there is, what is the cultural memory of tech? Simply put, Technology is not built in a vacuum and can't be neutral. Now, we can say as much as possible that the technologies that we build can be neutral. I personally feel that it is possible if you have enough voices, um, enough inputs, that you can build things that can genuinely be, um, that can genuinely transcend cultural borders. However, it is always built with the cultural perspective of its creators in mind. Um, as we go back to the, so we go back to algorithms. So Sol uh, Solon Barocas and Andrew Selbst in the California Law Review mentioned big data claims to be neutral, but an algorithm is only as good as the data it works with. Let's extend that definition to also say that even pro that anything involving what we are talking about here today, we all claim that the products that we build are neutral, the communities that we build are neutral, um, the the content that we share is neutral, but that's also as good as the data that we work with. Um, there are many examples of this. Wikipedia, for example, claims that we are very diverse. In fact, we are, but we only have, what, 17% of Wikipedia editors are women? Um, we still have a very big problem with systemic bias in the, um, in the developing world, where in content that we make, for example, in the Philippines, is more likely to be tagged for deletion simply because we can't find readily available information that articles. But let's look at another example. Um, and that would be one of my favorite websites. That would be Quora. Um, and why would this be the case? Um, I actually was at the Quora Top Writer Open House last night. Um, I did raise a question on what they're planning to do with, um, with bringing in more people from the developing world. Um, the answer that I got basically was they're working on improving the product, but Let's see exactly how that product is influenced by the cultural background of the people who first populated the site. So Quora basically was founded by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Adam D'Angelo. It was initially populated by users who were from Silicon Valley, often with a technical background to boot, which is the reason why you have a lot of questions that were relevant to the cultural bubble of Silicon Valley and of tech in general. What is it about living in San Francisco? What is it about getting a job interview at a big tech company like Google, Facebook, etc., or Asana, for example. Um, solutions to coding problems, how to deal with the fundament, uh, how to deal basically with living in, in tech, if you will, or topics relevant to the United States at large. Why Quora, for example, has a very liberal bias, or why a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters happen to be found online. So, given all of that, the culture that you build will inherently have a bias that leans towards the group of people that initially populated them. That will be the case of any community that you build. So let's say most of the let's say most of the people that you get are white males. The culture will heavily lean white male. If let's say you get a lot of people from a top university or from a couple of top universities, the culture will lean heavily towards that particular bubble. And even as new users come in, even as new people come in to join your community, the culture is still undeniably driven by what the culture is initially built. In the case of Quora, that would be Silicon Valley. That's the case, as I meant, and that will of course be the case of other web properties as well. Because that is something that we don't recognize as being, as being biased. For us, it's simply, that's how things have always been. Therefore, for us, we should always uh, we should just adjust to it, and you know, maybe things will work out so, um, in the future. We don't give a lot of thought into these things, because for us, the important thing is that we get to participate in the social life, the, uh, in the social life of these projects. 
And as such, this bias is unconscious and you don't really think about it until at some point you are forced to look into the mirror and therefore we have to take a look in um in, we have to take a look at that. At Wikimedia for example, um, we have recognized that yes the gender gap is a big problem and we have come up with solutions to that. Um, systemic bias in terms of geographic diversity is also a big problem. But these are things that um, we don't normally get to talk about in tech as a whole. Um, for example uh, if I were to talk about geographic diversity, um, usually we end up talking about these things in our countries of origin. We don't normally get to talk about them here in the United States with a receptive audience. Um, but at least given that we have a receptive audience, let's look now at how we can reshape the cultural memory of tech. Now that we know how it is built, how do we go about um, rebuilding or rather, redefining the cultural experience of being in uh, of being in that community and being of being in that project, for uh, so that everyone who uh, everyone who is there can better participate in the social life of those projects. I'm really nervous, guys. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating <laughs> I'm repeating myself. You're doing so good. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Um, so basically for me there are three things and these are things that I have experienced um, with my time at Wikimedia Philippines. We have really focused on trying to bring in more people, even at least from my country, into the English Wikipedia because about at the last count, I think 55% of all Wikipedia editors from the Philippines edit on the English Wikipedia, a project heavily dominated by Anglophone white males if you will. So there are three things. The first is we have to expand networks in order to allow for more people to participate. We like to say that, oh, we have very good outreach programs for bringing in people from developing countries. We have very good programs for bringing in women. But the problem there is that, at least for Wikipedia, we do not have a very good rate of converting people to editing full time. Um, and in order for you to be able to challenge existing cultural conventions, so these are whether or not, let's say, whether that be people being aggressive on Wikipedia and saying and pushing their point of view against the point of view of a newbie, or whether that, or um, having to adjust, let's say, your demeanor or your tone when interacting with other editors simply because um, you are not, uh, you are of, uh, your, your skin color is different or you're a woman. Um, in order for us to be able to challenge that, we need to actually bring in more people in order to make that happen. So whether that be going on, like what we've been doing is we've been partnering with organizations in the Philippines, um, we've been expanding into schools, we've been um, knocking on a lot of people's doors, if you will, in order to physically bring more people to our events, in order to bring more people um, and teach them about Wikipedia, to edit, um, to get them involved in the cultural life of these projects, and for us to play a supporting role in them to be integrated into these projects. That is very important in order to allow these people to feel that they have a stake in, um, in the projects that they're building and that it's not simply the domain of a select group of people. Once you do that, then what you do, then, then what you do is you open the conversation to include more stakeholders. Um, unfortunately on Wikipedia when we discuss a lot about um, developing world issues, the people who tend to make the, lo the loudest noise um, recently, we had a very raucous debate on net neutrality in Wikipedia Zero. The people who tend to make a lot of noise are people from developed countries. So people from Germany, people from the United States, people from the United Kingdom, people who um, generally come from a position wherein they can discuss these issues without having to feel any of the negative effects that would be associated with that. Basically, what happened there was we were told that net neutrality is bad, it is bad in all its forms, therefore Wikipedia Zero is also bad. We should not implement it in countries like India, the Philippines, or uh, Kenya, or where have you. The, uh, my position to that is, I personally think that net neutrality is a good thing, but I think that it is wrong for people to basically tell us that, oh, okay, you think that net neutrality is bad, therefore we should not be able to, we shouldn't expand access to information to people who need it the most. For me, my position basically is, I think that net neutrality is good, but let us get to a position first where we are comfortable 
with access, where basically we're people in this room. Um, if we get to a standard where comparable to the people in this room, where you have unfettered internet access, where you have, um, which is not, um, which is not uh, favored upon by particular telephone companies, for example, then that is something that we can pursue. Uh, we can pursue some at some point down the road. I don't want to say you know we should do it ten years from now, but of course we should do it as soon as we have the capability to have that discussion on an equal level with other stakeholders who are able to have that discussion from a pedestal, whereas we cannot. And finally, we have to be open to changes communities. Unfortunately, a lot of tech communities are very recalcitrant and are resistant to change. We've seen this with, we, we see this with Wikipedia, we see this with other communities, including the community that shall not be named that was mentioned this morning. Um, including, and, the thing there is that, unfortunately, the resist resistance to cultural change is a very human instinct. It's not something that was built into these communities, but it can be incorporated into them if, let's say, most people want to only, uh, most people that are in community A only want things to be done this way, and then you have someone from one who wants to join community A, wants to have things done differently, that person will probably end up being driven out, or will probably end up um, reluctant uh, acquiescing to how community A does things. That is something that, we, that I feel holds progress back for what we're doing here and holds progress back as well for reshaping, um, for reshaping the conversation that we have with regards to how we should be able to engage people using the products that we build. Um, but why exactly are people resistant to change? One of the more, more egregious examples is this was something that was written by a Quora user named Laura Hill, um, and she has researched on Quora's gender gap. And basically, she said in one of her answers, I can give you the link after this talk, when other nationalities begin to define a site, the perceived value of these properties declines, and people around the world begin to define them as niche sites for people of certain nationalities. The main premise there basically is that the only reason why Facebook is popular is because a lot of is because Facebook got critical mass in the United States. That could be said with Quora, that could be said with Wikipedia, that could be said with basically any other um, property that is out there. If let's say I wanted to popularize uh, Orkut, which was a Google property, but it never really became big in the United States, it became big in Brazil and India. But basically, it's just seen as a site for Brazilians and Indians, therefore it's not worth my time to either go there, be a member of that site, or for, um, for some people, let's say, invest in it, or to really um, step up my game there. Uh, if, let's say, I wanted to um, promote WeChat in the United States, WeChat is a Chinese chat app. It never really gained traction in the US, therefore it never really gained traction globally, simply because Unfortunately, it never really gained traction here. And the fact that the United States has a lot of cultural influence, whether that be in tech or elsewhere, will in turn dictate how the rest of the world uses technology. So, because we follow everybody else. But then the question there is, will Americans, let's say, see, oh, we've built this, um, I'm from country A, we built this, we think that it's better than anything that the US builds, will Americans adopt that, uh, um, adopt that as well? Usually it does not happen um, in most cases, of course this is very anecdotal on my part, but usually what happens there is it ends up being limited to the countries where these, these products were built and they never really gain global traction simply because they don't have influence here. That being said, it is not easy to reshape the cultural memory of tech, especially when the status quo is comfortable. For us, we feel that you know it's easy to simply have things as they go along because we don't really, we don't have to put a lot of effort into it. If if people like myself want to disrupt the way that, um, let's say, Facebook does safety check and wants to have more man-made disasters in developing countries does things, why should um, why should people, let's say, in the United States have to make the effort? Should be people from the Philippines, people from India, people from elsewhere. But the thing there is that we don't have that cultural pull. It's you guys that have that pull. It's you guys that have the influence to make these things happen. 
And these are and basically we have to have this meaningful conversation to allow these changes to happen, to allow for um, to allow for technology to be more inclusive of a global consensus and so basically become more uh, a, be a better embodiment of the diversity of the world as a whole. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation, for hearing me ramble on for the last 19 and a half minutes. <laughs> if you guys have questions, I will gladly take them in the remaining time that I have. Or if you like, please feel free to approach me at any time during the conference. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to mention, since you mentioned safety check, Facebook two days ago rolled out community created safety checks and they're actually taking the burden off themselves to like define what's a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I see this as like an optimistic thing that if we tell companies about the bias they have in their products, they can actually fix it and put more power in the hands of their users. Um, so I just want you to note that Facebook did make that change and it's really exciting and I'm glad that they like, corrected that bias. Well, I'm very glad to hear that as well. So, you know, I didn't know, I did not hear about that until right now. So thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I think it's at like 1% so, uh, two days ago. So it's very, very recent, but exciting. Hey, but at least it shows that pressure coming from people, and particularly people who, uh, particularly all the noise that's been made about that particular feature will eventually lead to changes which helps benefit everybody, so I'm glad to hear that. Hello, um, could you go over like quickly what Wikipedia Zero is for those of us less familiar with it, and um, what was the consensus reached on net neutrality on Wikipedia Zero? Uh, Wikipedia Zero is zero rated Wikipedia for developing countries. It was a program launched by the mobile team of, Wiki of the Wikipedia Foundation. Um, currently, it's deployed in over 40 countries. The Philippines had Wikipedia Zero at one point, but the agreement lapsed. That being said, um, the idea behind it was that um, for the Wikimedia Foundation and for the Wikimedia movement, it was not seen as a violation of net neutrality because we don't seek to profit from it, unlike Facebook Zero or our um, uh, Free Basics or other, free, uh, other zero rating programs. Um, the, whole, the problem there, however, was that you had people in the community who feel that any form of violation of net neutrality is still a violation of net neutrality. And so you had people in, and so you had Wikipedians who feel that Wikipedia Zero basically was the Wikimedia Foundation being hypocritical and saying that, oh, the, um, you want to expand knowledge, but you're still only giving them a subset of knowledge. You're not giving them access to, like, let's say, all the external references that you have linked to Wikipedia articles. Um, there is no consensus on the matter. You have people on both sides. For example, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm on the opposite side. I feel that Wikipedia Zero is a good thing. You have people in developing countries, largely in India, who also feel that Wikipedia Zero is a bad thing. So we're still having the debate um, as to whether or not this will ultimately lead to a moral victory for Wikipedia Zero or a, a systemic cutting of the program, if you will. That is something that I will look forward to seeing as we continue to have that discussion. All right.